Hey everyone, Mr. Jennings here. Today we are going to be talking about the evidence for evolution. Now, evolution is one of the central linchpin unifying concepts in biology. It's one of the reasons we teach it last is because it kind of pulls things together. Now we're going to talk about what pieces of evidence to help support this theory and why it's such a big deal. All right, let's get rolling. So, first off, uh, Darwin argued that living things have been evolving for millions of years. Um, one of the misconceptions is, for that time was the Earth was very small, I mean, very small, very young. Uh, Darwin said, no, it's quite old. We have all this evidence to say this. And because it's so old, this happens to work really well. So Darwin's evidence for evolution and really modern evolution in general can be construed down to four points. The fossil record, biogeography, homologous structures, and embryology. The fossil record is probably the most well-known and probably the most famous. Just because, uh, not just the most famous, probably the most well understood because it's you know, something physical. We can actually see it and it kind of makes sense. We can see, hey, certain structures look very similar. And that's going to be very really important. So fossil records are the rem fossils are the remains of previously living organisms, and the fossil record is a collection of those. Scientists like to compare fossils to each other and living organisms to help find any similarities. And the general rule is similarities imply relatedness. Uh, basically, the word it works is it's very unlikely two different organisms evolved to have very similar structures and have very similar bone structure or hair structure, etc., without being related. Not impossible, very unlikely. And that's the big thing with the false record. It implies there's something more going on, usually. There has to be some kind of relatedness. Now, what we can do is by looking at the false record, because the way fossils work is they're deposited in layers, we can look at the fossils in order to see the development of a species over time. Now, we have some notable uh, organisms here in the picture. So, first off, in this one here, we have Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is the transitional fossil uh, species between birds and dinosaurs, noted for having true wings, have a feathery tail, but very reptilian bone structure, along with a mix of bird bone structure. So, pretty much a major fossil find for the uh, dinosaur transitions. Over here, we have the transition of uh, dolphin and, sorry, transition between land animal, land mammal to marine mammal like a dolphin. Uh, this thing was quite scary looking. Now, biogeography is one that Darwin liked to specialize in along with the fossil record. Biogeography was the distribution of living organisms around the biosphere. And scientists can refer related to some species by observing their locations and similar traits. Basically, how similar species is are related, sorry, explains how species are related and how similar species are not related. This is a little complicated. Uh, so there are times where organisms can look very similar but not be related. Um, great example of this is you can look at the marsupials of Australia. I believe I have that on the next slide. I don't want to take it. Um, well, if you look at marsupials of Australia, you would see that they look very similar to mammals we have up here, like the kangaroo mouse versus the regular field mouse. They look very similar. However, the kangaroo mouse is a marsupial, the field mouse is not. And the reason they look so similar is they occupy the same niche and in the same environment. See, biogeography explains not only how species are related, but also how species can look similar but not be related. So if organisms are found in very similar biomes, or ecosystems, there's a good chance they may look very similar to one another because there's reasons to do that. What is true about one environment may possibly be true about another. What works in one area works well with others. They're very similar. So it tends to be certain niches take certain shapes. <clears throat> so biogeography helps explain this. Now the picture I have up here are the large rodent species of the Americas. We have the beaver and the muskrat. That's a muskrat. That's obviously the beaver. And if you go further South America, into South America, you're going to find the capybara, the world's largest rodent species, and the coipil, which is a fairly large rodent species. They are all related to each other. You can look and see 
man, these kind of look similar. They look like a beaver in some ways, uh, but they look different enough. Now, the reason they're related is both they probably came from, you know, probably lived on the same landmass, obviously, all this entire time, and, you know, just moved around. So that's why we use biogeography to explain how they're related. Now, that goes on to add to something we call homologous structures. Now, homologous structures are structures that are similar development and structure, sorry, development and structure, but not necessarily the same function. So they look the same, but they may not work the same. Uh, they develop from the same embryonic tissues, basically in the development of the offspring, in the womb, or in the egg. They develop, or even elsewhere, but let's say we're talking, uh, you know, vertebrates. When we talk vertebrates, they are going to see, they start with the same basic tissues and they develop very similarly. Uh, we can look at the vertebrate forelimb. They are probably this, one of those classic examples. We see, you know, one bone, two bone, many bones, about five bones. That tends to be the trend between turtles, alligators, birds, and mammals. Uh, the horse, obviously, is the exception. That's one of the things I wish they did in this picture. But we can see that. Now, opposite, sorry, a continuation of homologous structures is vestigial structures. These are homologous structures that don't really have a benefit anymore. They can actually be harmful, but more often than not, they're malign, or at least not dangerous enough to where there's a high selection of pressure to get rid of them. They're usually just diminished. A great example of this is the appendix, wisdom teeth, and high limbs of wells. The appendix, well, it goes without saying, it's one of the, it's one of those organs that most people know. If it gets infected and ruptures, it can be fatal. Uh, that's what the little comic there is talking about. The appendix is a evolutionary holdover of the ruminatory stomach. Uh, various mammals have the ruminatory stomach. It's an area for food to sit and ferment. To, and it helps with digestion. We don't do that. We don't digest like that. So it has a larger, has largely diminished into its role. So it's much smaller. It has some immune activity. Uh, but for the most part, it's largely vestigial. You will be fine without it. And most people will never have any problems out of it. The select like handful will develop appendicitis. And when appendicitis hits, if it gets to become acute appendicitis, it could be fatal. Uh, wisdom teeth, most of y'all listening to this at the, are at the age where wisdom teeth start becoming a problem. Uh, at one point in time, human jaws used to be a little bit bigger, and they could accommodate the last set of molars. Those molars didn't come, don't come into usually your teens. Well, once you get these molars in, uh, once you get the molars in, they become a problem. Um, they start pushing your other teeth out to be accommodated. Because it's too small, creating great, great discomfort and pain. So most people usually have to get them extracted. Uh, there's actually selective pressure for this. So there's that, oddly enough, some people, you may know some friends or family, that have not had all their wisdom teeth. And some people are born that get their wisdom teeth and it does not affect their teeth at all because their jaws are just big enough. So it's kind of a nice variation within humans. And the whale's hind limb is basically a vestigial holdover back for when you know, whales looked like that dog-like creature. Uh, there are basically, we have fossil records showing that there was whales with four, fin, four sets of flippers or fins. Um, the problem with those were they were, you know, reduced drag that didn't give any benefit. We believe the only benefit for them was to help with mating and would help with actually be able to mate in the water. Once that was no longer needed, there was no reason to keep them around. However, you can still find the whale's hind limb bones floating in their body mass. To this day, much, much smaller, but they're still there. Now, the last piece of evidence is embryology. Now, embryology is the study of embryos, which are the early stages of development of vertebrates. And if you look at them, uh, typically all vertebrates look very similar at certain points of the development. And what happens is, over time, they, you know, over the development period, they start differentiating. The original concepts of embryology was a little bit different. It was more about the idea that all the evolutionary processes take place in the embryo, and that was not really true. 
However, you can study the embryo and see various you know, evolutionary similarities, common ancestry, be bore out, and but there is differentiation. So, for instance, in the picture here, we have you know salamander all the way up to human. Uh, the further up they are, closer they are, the more related they are. So we can look here at you know this stage starting right here. The that the uh, blastula looks completely different from each other on these lower levels. But we can look here. Let's look at just the mammals. When we get to the body segmentation stage, the mammals look very similar to one another. And they look very similar all the way up until like the larval fetal stage. And that's when we start seeing differentiation. Uh, even then, you look at the monkey and human, you can see very strong similarities. is isn't until much later into the birth we see they look very different. There's also differences in size, development. Uh, humans are notable for being kind of underdeveloped when they're born. And that's because of some evolutionary trade-off of being upright walking. But it's just an interesting study, to say the least. Okay, let's kind of wrap things up here. So evolution is a major, major unifying theory. And today we just talked about some four pieces of evidence. We talked about, you know, fossil records. We talked about biogeography. We talked about anatomical records and, you know, homologous structures. And we also talked about embryology. There are many more pieces of evidence out there. And that's why this week I've assigned you all to watch uh, Finding Your Inner Fish Part 1. It's a good introductory port portion to the evolution evidence pieces. It talks about the founding of some major transitional fossils known as Tiktaalik. It's based off a book called Finding Your Inner Fish by Neil Shubin, Dr. Neil Shubin. I highly recommend the book. It's a very interesting read, especially because it talks about the historical development of the theory of evolution. And I think it's really worth, you know, like the history of science just as much as I like the science itself. All right. That said, that's it for today, and uh, probably this week. This week, like I said, I'm going to send you that hour-long documentary and this, and that'll probably be it in terms of video content. Um, we are coming down to the end here. Um, we are not obviously going back to school um, quarter during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, if I decide to use this in the future. Uh, because we are not going back to school, we are going to... Take our time with evolution a little bit. Uh, we have about a few weeks left of new content, and we'll discuss more about that when it comes time. Other than that, though, thank you all for watching. I do truly miss you all. You all have been. But until next time, have a great day.